International is a member. Jeffrey is a member of the board of directors of the Child Welfare League of Canada, the Association of Native Child and Family Service Services Agencies of Ontario, and the Toronto Aboriginal Support Services Council, and is also a member of Toronto's Aboriginal Affairs Committee. Dr. Schiffer has Métis and German ancestry and was born and raised in unceded Coast Salish Territory in what is today Vancouver, British Columbia. Jeffrey holds a BA in Anthropology from the University of British Columbia and a Master's and PhD in Anthropology and respectively Anthropology and Education from Columbia University. Dr. Schiffer has conducted community-based research and program development with Indigenous communities in Canada and Central America. His dissertation focused on decolonizing and indigenizing Aboriginal child welfare in Canadian cities. Over the past 15 years, Dr. Schiffer has held positions at the Earth Institute at Columbia University, Vancouver Aboriginal Child and Family Services Society, the Justice Institute of British Columbia, and the City of Toronto. Throughout this time, he has also taught in the Indigenous Focused Oriented Therapy Program and the Indigenous Tools for Living Training. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Schiffer, having you with us this evening. Uh, we're going to jump right to the questions for you. you. Um, I think John and I are going to just say a quick hello. Would you like to see? Uh, we can do that too. Mitzi, ladies first. I, I just oh, want to say uh, hello to everyone. Uh, I know that uh, over the last more than a year, we've been meeting to talk about uh, the effects of the pandemic and uh, COVID-19. But, you know, we, we've interrupted this program because of the, um, the, the times that we are in and, uh, and having a conversation um, that really, you know, can can open up a dialogue in our community around Indigenous uh, peoples who, who are a, an important part um, of, of our riding and a very vibrant and active part um, at the centre is the, the Native Child and Family um, location on Galloway Road. Um, you know, it has, it has a beautiful canoe shape, so you can't miss it when you're going along Kingston Road. And, uh, and so, Dr. Schiffer, it's really an honour to have you and, um, you know, I know that I'm I'm in a, a state of of heightened awareness right now um, by what what is happening in our nation and in our country. So um, to have this discussion at this time, I think is really valuable and really important. So um, as the MPP for Scarborough Guildwood, I'm very very happy to uh, join my colleagues and to welcome you tonight. Great, thank you. <laughs> and um, I suppose it's my turn, uh, Jeff. Um, Absolutely delighted to have you um, again. <laughs> um, I, I, I some I, I sort of feel like we're neighbors and um, and uh, friends because you've been on a pad podcast with me. You've been at, um, at our committee. Um, you've um, been supremely articulate on uh, the issues that we're going to discuss tonight, and the timing uh, couldn't be better. I, I could say the timing couldn't be worse as well, uh, but the timing couldn't be better because I think it's important that the people of Scarborough Guildwood have this conversation. And I'm hoping that over the course of the evening, you are able to uh, inform the people of Scarborough Guildwood about um, the presence of the Indigenous uh, peoples in our own community, which mm -hmm. frequently um, we are not, not aware of. So um, as awareness issues go, I'm rather hoping that over the, as I say, over the course of the next hour, we get the chance to ask questions, but also you get to um, be your supremely articulate self. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Jeff. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you, Mitzi and John. And to the questions, Jeffrey. Sure. In, and I'll, I'm going to start. Uh, in your opinion, has the City of Toronto gone far enough in implementing its statement of commitment to Aboriginal peoples and ensuring that Indigenous culture and identity is represented and visible throughout the City of Toronto? 
Perfect. Good question. So I'll start by saying thank you very much for the invitation. Um, as an organ, you know, as the head of an organization that's funded by all three levels of government, I appreciate being here with a councillor and a representative of the province and and the federal government. It's actually quite nice. Um, and uh, and so I've been a native child now for just over three years. I also want to acknowledge the great work done by Ken Richard, who was our founder and and first executive director. And our agency has been around for almost 35 years now, founded in '86. So we've been working with the indigenous community, and I like to say communities across Toronto for quite some time. Um, you know, I you know as you said in my bio, you know I was born and raised in Vancouver. And, you know, I don't know how many of you have spent time in Vancouver, but you walk around Vancouver. In fact, if you were to fly to Vancouver, particularly from the International Terminal, the first thing you do when you when you get off the plane is walk through this amazing wing of the airport, which has totem poles and Ida carving. And in fact, the, the carving that you see on the $20 bill uh, is in the airport in Vancouver. Uh, Vancouver is a city where it's hard to throw a stone and not hit something that doesn't look Indigenous. The representation there is phenomenal, right? So. So while I would say the city has been pushing um, to ensure that organizations like Native Child are better positioned to to create um, you know spaces that are reflective of the Indigenous community that not only um, that not only allow Indigenous community members to to see themselves reflected in their community, but also that serve as sites to support truth and reconciliation for non-Indigenous people who can learn about Indigenous culture and history throughout all of the design elements in those spaces. Uh, I would still say that we have we have some work to do, right? But I do want to flag a couple of things. You know, we um, you know we have our center at Kingston and Galloway, which has been there for quite some time, supported by the city. Uh, we have another new office right next to John's, in fact, and we've just opened a little bit out of your writing, but we have opened our new Malvern Aboriginal Child and Family Center. So spaces are continuing to open, and in fact, the city is developing the last undeveloped piece of Nathan Phillips Square, uh, which is probably one of the most expensive pieces of real estate in, in, the, in the country, um, to, that will eventually be an Indigenous healing garden, right, to, to honour um, residential school survivors. So, so I think it's important for us always to recognise there is a great deal of work to do, uh, but Toronto is on that path and, and we're certainly grateful to be part of it. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, merci. So, you know, Jeff, um, I'm hoping tonight we we can use this hour to to have a safe place really to discuss um, what's been in the news and what's really um, you know it's almost as if it's a time of awakening in terms yeah. of of the knowledge and the information around um, indigenous uh, as far you know as it, it, it's it's not even the full history but just the recent history with residential schools and, and the survivors. Um, and now the discovery of, uh, of mass graves, first in Kamloops and now um, the site in Saskatchewan and, and there are others, right? Um, in Ontario, $10 million has been um, put aside to, to help with that effort to, to search uh, those grounds. So can you um, just, you know, just open up that discussion, um, you know, for those that are watching. And and then I, I, I would like to to ask about, you know, the curriculum and, and the education system, you know, really telling the the, the proper history and whether or not you, you believe that that should be uh, done better, differently, uh, made mandatory, perhaps right now it's optional um, and what we can do so that this is not such uh, shocking news that we actually do know and understand the real history and um, and that we are addressing that in our education system. But if you could just kind of open up the discussion around those uh, discoveries um, for, sure. for those watching tonight. Yeah, so I remember my time in the City of Toronto with fondness. I spent some time in the City of Toronto as the Indigenous Affairs Consultant. And during that time, one of the things I did was develop the Indigenous Cultural Competency Training for the City of Toronto, for the Toronto Public Service. And I remember spending time in Metro Hall delivering this curriculum I had developed to, you know, directors from across the city. And I remember the frequency with which these folks would look at me and say, good God, Jeff, I had no idea, right? Um, you know, I did, John mentioned the podcast I had the opportunity of participating in earlier, in which I talked a little bit about my personal story. My mother is a survivor of a lot of abuse as a child. Uh, she spent some time in the foster care system. I, in fact, have a cousin 
that I met months ago in the midst of the pandemic, who was taken in the 60s scoop, uh, who was lost to our family for 50 years, right? Wow. So indigenous, indigenous families have been broken. <laughs> they have been broken. Uh, and, and with the same systematic um, fervor with which indigenous sophistication and complexity was erased to um, legitimize the process of uh, occupying indigenous lands for the development, which has contributed to the standard of living that all indigenous Canadian non-indigenous Canadians enjoy. Um, all of the 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 process that came with attempted cultural genocide and assimilation and removing children from their families and the transition from residential schools into mainstream child welfare, all of that history has been removed from our well, it was not not removed, it was never included. It was never included in our in our curriculums in any significant way, right? Meritori came to the opening of our Mount Dennis. Uh, launch on June 21st on Indigenous Peoples Day. And one of the things he said when he was sharing words was that he was a history student in Canadian post-secondary and heard nothing about this stuff. So this is an interesting time. It's and, and, it's not either or. For a lot of Canadians, they find themselves confronted uh, with, with bodies that make Canada's history real. The little children, these tiny little sacred bundles buried beneath the ground that were just a possibility until not too long ago. For Indigenous people, in, they are triggered with trauma that is lived, vicarious, and intergenerational that connects them back to historical histories of child removal and abuse and death and cultural disconnectedness and um, disempowerment from their language and culture, right? So it's a, it's a complex time uh, for Canada. Murray Sinclair, who many of us know as the commissioner of the Truth and Reconciliation oh, Commission, later, later a senator, you know, doing lots of other phenomenal things, famously said, education got us into this mess, education will get us out, right? We have got to invest in ensuring that not only as adults, we get the kind of cultural competency training that's required for us to pivot in real time uh, within the context of our work and our lives now, but it is completely incumbent upon us to make sure that children growing up in Canada understand our colonial history for a number of reasons, right? Not just for, not just for the truth part of the truth and reconciliation equation, not just for them to be able to come to grips and fully understand the colonial history of Canada and the way that that impacts our lives right now in the present, but also because of the sophistication and complexity that I mentioned previously, right? The, the Mayan Metropolitan Centre at its height was composed of 60,000 structures spanning the area of modern New York City. The Southwestern Pueblo people built the first condominiums in Turtle Island. The, the U.S. Constitution is based on the great law of peace from the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. There is knowledge and tools and innovation that still exists among Indigenous people that our children are not benefiting from. The problems we face today as a human family are incredibly complex. Poverty, climate change, systemic racism. We are solving them with this many tools in our toolbox when we could use this many. Right. We are not allowing our kids to benefit from indigenous tools and approaches and they don't just benefit indigenous people. They benefit everyone. Right. So one of the decisions that I have trouble with was the decision of this current provincial administration. And I'll say that I work with this current government in many positive and supportive and collaborative ways. But one of the things I have real trouble with was the decision to repeal the curriculum changes to the Ontario uh, you know, curriculum to get indigenous content um, into the curriculum for all the reasons I just stated. We need it throughout the K-12 system consistently, and we need it applied not as an elective, but as a requirement uh, as folks move through post-secondary. Yeah, big wedge. Well said. John, your turn for a question. Indeed, Indeed uh, and Jeffrey, um, you have lived up to your usual incredibly articulate self. So let me, let me ask you a couple of questions um, with respect to appropriation. Um, you talked about the Vancouver airport, and I think it is the best airport in the world, is my own opinion, um, having flown through it. And it, one of the reasons is that you arrive and you get a sense of not only the present, but the past, and that it is um, replete with many, many uh, Indigenous um, symbols, artifacts, uh, whatever. So the question I have is, is the Vancouver airport an example of appropriation mm -hmm. by the 
dominant, quote unquote, dominant culture of uh, the um, the uh, uh, of, of indigenous culture. So I'd be curious as to whether um, you think that might actually be true. Yeah, it's a tricky. I mean, it's a good question. It's one that that's that we need to ask ourselves, particularly when we go around. I mean, you don't just want to put beads and feathers on everything and say that you've created indigenous identity across the city. Exactly. It's, it's a good question, yeah. right? The process by which we do that. I mean, it goes back to that axiom that nothing about us without us axiom, right? And it's about including indigenous people, you know, in those decisions and ensuring that the folks that are producing. The, the stuff for the exhibit or the design features for the building, that their voice and their culture is actually included in that. Um, it's in, in, in diverse urban spaces, this becomes really complex because we have diverse indigenous people. It's not like we're gonna have something that's just created by an Anishinaabe person because of the reality, particularly in Scarborough, is that a lot of residents are Anishinaabe and Caribbean or you know Cree and Dutch or, or whatever else, right? And so the appropriation question takes on new levels of complexity when we start to see the intersectionalities that indigenous people have come to become in an urban I'm setting. I'm told some, as some I'm, I'm told this actually includes German people. What a concept, eh? Right, I know. Yeah. I, I, like, I mean, there is such a visual diversity in, in what yeah. people look like. But no, I mean, I think, so I don't know the story of the Vancouver airport. What I do know is that the city of Vancouver has pretty good relationships with what they call the four, first, four host First Nations, apologies, the same ones that were involved in the Olympics, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, that, and the conversations between city council uh, and those four host nations uh, are central to a lot of the larger developments that occur within those lands. And then throughout that process, they're able to get around the appropriation question. Go to Gastown and look at some of the small little shops and selling Indigenous tourist items and look at the Made in China logo that's on the bottom of them. And that's kind of getting us closer to appropriation, right? <laughs> so I think that um, when we start to see Indigenous features or or, or, or parts of tourism or things that are sold that, that aren't of and for Indigenous people, that's when we start to, uh, you know, get us into that okay, appropriate it, it strikes me that the airport is so impressive that it would be very hard to imagine that it wasn't done with with extensive consultation and impl and involvement of of the, the artists in particular. But, uh, 100%. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, am I to do another question, Paul, or is it back to you? I think we're rotating through one at a time. To, okay, go for it, Paul. So, and uh, Jeffrey, my question uh, from one of my constituents kind of ties into what we were just talking about. Your next question, um, she's asking, where do you see Indigenous history being represented properly within Toronto? Or what can we do to show a representation of Indigenous practices and culture within our city? Okay, so... I mean, there are a few examples of people trying to integrate uh, Indigenous history uh, into the city of Toronto. It certainly happens through Indigenous agencies that are part of the, you know, Toronto Aboriginal Support Services Council. It's happening in great ways through Wandering Spirit School, which is an Aboriginal focused school uh, close to where I am right now on the Danforth. Um, and, you know, it's uh, certainly you can go to museums and things like that. I think that... Um, you know, and, and there's like first story where there's walks and there's talks about re, like as we move into the ravine strategy and the indis indigenous placemaking strategy, there's talks about um, reinvigorating, you know, historical pathways that were utilized by indigenous people with plaques and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and I think that's all really important work. Um, but one of the reasons why earlier I was talking about how we need to get Indigenous content into the curriculum, not only so that Canadians understand our history, but also so that we can understand our future, is because I think it's really important for us not only to focus on Indigenous history. I remember growing up in Vancouver, uh, you know, there was some, as I got into the higher grades into high school, there was some Indigenous content, but it was all about Indigenous people in the past, right? So it was like, oh, okay, I guess, so there were Indigenous people, but I guess they're all gone now because they were running around with bows and arrows and then they just disappeared, right? Um, where, where in fact, some of the most amazing Canadian innovations were stemmed through Indigenous people. So I think as much as it's important for us to focus on Indigenous history and make that apparent and teach it and make it visible, it's also important for us to engage with contemporary Indigenous culture and society. It is vibrant. It is changing. It is taking the, all of the language and concepts and, and history and moving it through the lens of the present and giving us innovation, right? Um, and so we also want to uh, we also want to show and share and represent all of that stuff too, if that makes sense. 
Yep. Yeah. And I and I think of the city of Toronto. We we created an Indigenous Affairs office back in I think 2017 because we wanted that comprehensive uh, look. We just we wanted across every agency, division, department within the within the city of Toronto. So 100% get that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Mitzi. Thank you. I, I actually wanted to to talk about the present and how, you know, because if, if we look at some of the histories, for instance, of the education system, you know, Egerton uh, Ryerson, uh, you know, he de deliberately excluded Indigenous students from the public school system at the time, it, Indigenous and Black students. Um, so they, they had a, a less funded system. Um, and that, that has had ramifications uh, throughout uh, over the years. And so, you know, we look at some of these, these um, systems today, the foster system, for instance, the adoption system, and, and there isn't fairness um, being applied. And uh, and there's still what 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 is seen as a as a as a bias um, against um, indigenous families and and I wonder if you can speak to how how we um, how how do we do better you know yeah. but what do we need to do to do better there Yeah, I mean I think one of the reasons why I mean. So one of the one of the impacts of removing all of that history and content from curriculum and just Canadian popular culture in general is the fact that Canadians are mystified as to how Indigenous people got to where they are in terms of all the deficit based statistics that we use to describe them. And that so conveniently plays into some of the stereotypes around Indigenous people just being kind of lazy and not intelligent and prone towards substance abuse. And it's very easy to characterize people in those ways when you have no idea how they how they became to have so many challenges in their lives. Right. Um, and, and so the, the history part, it is so important for us to understand. I mean, this stuff is intergenerational. We know in a very evidence-based way now that intergenerational trauma is a real thing, right? We used the word first when we were talking about Holocaust survivors who, you know, who had children that would wake up screaming here in North America, having nightmares, not even knowing that their parents had been in concentration camps, you know, a decade earlier across the pond, so to speak, right? So there are very real concrete impacts that Indigenous children and families are experiencing today because of the legacy of residential schooling, right? Since we found those 215 little kids buried in British Columbia, I've talked to dozens and dozens and dozens of Indigenous people about the impact. I have not met one Indigenous person who told me they had no connection to the residential school system or the child welfare system. It was pervasive, right? It impacted almost every family. Um, and Indigenous people carry that. They carry that with them today, right? So I think um, it's important, like, I mean, and this is what takes me to the place of, okay, so we've just, we've just designated in the province of Ontario $10 million uh, to find Indigenous kids um, who are buried in the ground. But we still have tens of thousands of Indigenous kids that don't have clean drinking water or access to the proper, proper prevention services they need, or a medical center in their community, right? So we need money for the kids that are still alive. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, so this is what I mean about us. We always we like to focus on the past um, without kind of bringing all of that knowledge forward to help us understand where we are right now and figure out how we orient our, our pathway forward. I don't know, that was a bit of a tangent. I hope that answered your question. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, it speaks very well, Jack. And, um, you know, I, I had, just uh, the fortune of uh, sitting down with uh, Senator St. Clair, Murray St. Clair, um, when I was education minister. And I, you know, I remember he sort of, you know, really drew me in and he said, you know, Mitzi, education heals, you know, that, and, and that, that is the broad sense, right? So it's what's being taught in the curriculum, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of evidence that shows um, if we invest to the same level in the education for Indigenous child, that they will grow up with the same advantages that every child grows up with, having had that investment. And so, so we need to make sure that, that that's done um, and that there is equity brought into our, our system of education um, wherever that child lives in this province. 
and I think we do it best when we collaborate, uh, when, when, when we have a collaboration between an organization like mine and all three levels of government like yours. And I think about our Scarborough um, Aboriginal Child and Family Life Centre right there at Kingston and Galloway, and everybody that I'm seeing, and I'm only seeing the three of you, I don't see everyone else who's joining us, but all of us have contributed to make that space what it is, right? It's city funding, it's provincial funding, it's federal funding that enables us to wrap those communities in a holistic, culturally grounded services to address that intergenerational trauma but it's also not about simply addressing those historical challenges. It's also about identifying multiple concrete pathways to wellness beyond that process of healing. That's why we do GED programs there. That's why we do our summer camps there. That's why we do education and employment services alongside our youth engagements and clinical services and senior supports, right? And none of that would be possible without a community-based indigenous governed and driven organization like Native Child um, and without the adequate resources coming from multiple levels of government to realize that vision. So I just I just want to um, emphasize that and, and thank you all for making that vision a reality for community uh, because it does and it is making a difference. Excellent. John? Um, I want to pick up with the phrase uh, education get, I think it's education get us into this mess, education gets us out, something to that effect. I think that's Murray Sinclair. And and deal with some of the, the things that are currently um, not to, to, to find a point on it, but Edgar Ryerson obviously has a mixed history. But one of the things he is known for is, is that he um, is the um, public education system and he fought the family compact which wanted to have a British system very similar to elite education. Um, and in that respect, uh, he is to be, um, to be acknowledged for his contribution to public education. Having said that, um, we are now into um, uh, some considerable difficulties as to uh, the issues of what constitutes uh, a person that is appropriate to give and, and in Indigenous education, Queen's University, for instance, is going through its own uh, review of faculty, uh, um, what it's uh, faculty, um, Indigenous faculty members. So I'd be interested in your thoughts as to um, who is um, the appropriate uh, person to uh, bring the 21st century public education system uh, into um, uh, an appropriate um, understanding of uh, all of the all all of the issues. Um, so mm -hmm. it's I, I apologize for the, the the question being a little bit too vague, but on the other hand, it is these are live issues as to who speaks for indigenous uh, peoples, particularly at the highest level of our education system. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a complex, uh, it, oh, sorry, John, were you finished? Um, and yeah, well, I just think in particular are supremely well-educated and um, supremely articulate. I think I've said that too many times. You are <laughs> very articulate, Jeff. Um, uh, but it it strikes me as something that we need to get right if we are to go forward. So I'd be interested in your thoughts. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's a complex and layered question. Um, and there's many different parts and I want to address them uh, separately. So I mean, I think, I think the first thing is uh, who generates the content for the curriculum, right? Um, and I, so I think it is so important at every level, whether it's K to 12 or post-secondary, that the content generated about Indigenous people um, is directed by and created by Indigenous people themselves, right? That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, you mentioned, uh, then, so there's the, there's the content, there's the pedagogy, right? The way that it's taught, uh, and then there's who te who's teaching it. And these three things are important. The content, I think, most definitely needs to be created by Indigenous people. 
the pedagogy, the way that it's taught, it's also important for us to get indigenous ways of teaching and knowing into the classroom. And we see this a lot through the emphasis of outdoor education, for example, uh, getting kids outside, like the work that we do in our Native Child Early On Centers and our Aboriginal Head Starts and our Native Learning Centers and the TDSB, the way that we do our GED programs and our partnerships with Centennial College and other post-secondaries, the way that the curriculum is taught prioritizes Indigenous ways of knowing and being um, because not everybody learns in the same way and not every cultural approach is geared towards taking in information in a particular way. So it's also important that uh, we get some of those Indigenous teaching methods into the classroom and that as much as we can, we take the classroom outside to learn from our non-human relatives, the land and the trees and the water. And there's lots of stuff there that is maybe for a separate tangent that I'm going to spare you all uh, this evening. Um, and then when it comes to who, who's teaching it, I mean, of course, unquestionably, um, the preference would be an Indigenous teacher. Um, but that, that preference has to be cast against the reality of the size of the public education system and post-secondary system and the number of available Indigenous teachers and professors, right? Um, so it's not always possible. It is not always possible to find an Indigenous teacher. What do you do when you can't find an Indigenous teacher? I think it's about then understanding your role as an ally and as a non-Indigenous teacher in sharing that information. It's about finding other resources that em empower you to do it in a way that is not uh, um, the kind of cultural appropriation we talked about earlier. It would be about bringing elders and knowledge keepers into that classroom uh, to be able to share some of the information that you may not be able to share as a non-Indigenous teacher. So I think that there's ways that it can be done. Uh, and I think that we need to um, you know, implement this sort of thing uh, within the reality that we that we live in, um, because I just don't think it's possible for us for every every school across the uh, across Canada to have an Indigenous teacher teaching Indigenous subject matter at this time. As the population grows, we may get there. Uh, hopefully, that kind of gets to your question. No, no. I, I would I would I, I just um, hope that. Um, if, I, if I'm using Queen's University as an example, that yeah. um, they don't um, uh, they don't uh, destroy the allies while trying to get to um, getting people who to teach who may or may not be um, well may or may not be more qualified. That's I guess. Yeah, I mean the there, there's a. Yes. So there's a big there's a big dynamic conversation going on right now about who is fit to represent the indigenous community in a whole bunch of different areas. Uh, and that is an incredibly, incredibly complex question. Uh, you will get varied answers depending on uh, who you are speaking with. I completely under, you know, I completely, we cannot have non-Indigenous people masquerading as Indigenous people and and, and, claim, yep. and claiming that they are connected to those communities. Uh, but at the same time, Indigenous people look very different. You know, they could look like me. Uh, they could look like, you know, somebody else. Um, and so the, the continuum of how Indigenous people look is very different. And also their history the histories are broken, right? So some people might have a status card and be able to point right to an indigenous history or an indigenous person. Somebody else may have four generations within residential schooling and child welfare and not know exactly where their family members are. That doesn't mean they're not indigenous. It means that their history has been smashed to pieces uh, through a colonial process. Um, but that doesn't mean that we should tell them that they're not indigenous enough to be engaged in community and support some of the work that's required. Figuring out where those lines are is not black and white. Um, and so I think it's a conversation that we move, need to move through very carefully. And I think as we do, we need to keep Aboriginal values at the center. Those those seven grandfather teachings, right? So that we're, we're, we're moving forward in ways that are kind and brave and courageous and honest and with integrity and all the rest of it, right? That's kind of how I anchor myself when things get tough. And Jeffrey, how do you how do you start to have that conversation? For example, in Toronto, you have Native Child and Family Services. Um, the City of Toronto has the Indigenous Affairs Office. But if you go into smaller communities, you know whether it's you know Fort Erie or you know Thunder Bay, they might not have a Native and Native and Child Family Services Office, anything like that. Like how? How do you try to decide who who gives the voice, who leads? 
Yeah, I mean, and this is a good question. And I've had conversations with folks recently outside of the, you know, outside of the Toronto jurisdiction um, in Peel and Halton uh, in Hamilton and areas where there are, well, Hamilton has a good presence, but Halton, for example, has no Indigenous services, no Friendship Centre, um, you know, no Aboriginal Child and Family Service Agency, nothing, right? Uh, in those cases right now, because of the conversation and because of where we are, we're starting to see the emergence of of grassroots indigenous groups and collectives that are coming together to start to kind of share some of that knowledge. So I think um, however large or small your municipal bureaucracy is, it's good to start trying to make space uh, for those conversations however you can and when you can. The other thing that I think, and I always look for silver linings, and COVID does have multiple silver linings, one of them is the way that we've all pivoted into virtual services, right? A year ago, 18 months ago, we might have been having this conversation in person, you know, um, sitting around a table. We might have even been sharing some food or there might have, there might have been coffee, right? Remember those days? But, but, you know, as we've all been locked down and responding to this global <laughs> pandemic, everybody has pivoted to virtual services. And we have noticed at Native Child um, that our, our virtual services are no longer just being accessed by people in the city of Toronto. They're being accessed by community members in all sorts of different places. So I think also um, being able to support each other through virtual services is a good way for us to start the conversation. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, one of the questions that I got from one of my residents, the, they're asking about your Métis heritage. Mm -hmm. And if you could explain your Métis heritage. Sure, yeah. So my mother is a, a woman named uh, Shirley Turcott, and, um, you know, she was born and raised just north of Winnipeg. So she grew up on the, uh, on the north end of Winnipeg. Uh, and my Métis ancestry comes from the Turcott family. Um, so the way that we understand it uh, is that it comes actually from, so the, the farthest we've been able to trace it back, and I should say that, you know, because my mother and her siblings did go through the foster care system because there was a lot of trauma um, and abuse in my family, uh, it has been challenging for us um, to uh, to make a good connection with where my great grandfather was born um, in what is today Turtle Mountain, North Dakota, which was a very large Métis settlement just across the 49th parallel. And um, through through documentation and oral history, uh, he came north actually when he was eight years old uh, by ox and cart to Saskatchewan. Uh, and he had a farming community there um, where people gather. This is the time when there were Métis road allowances and they were giving out Métis land. He was a beater. He raised horses. He um, was a musician um, and later uh, uh, immigrated to Manitoba, north of uh, north of Winnipeg. So my family history kind of meanders, meanders that way. Right. But my mother, all we, you know, my mother and her siblings grew up, in fact, uh, being beaten up at school for being half breeds, you know, being called. Uh, you know, dirty half breeds, um, and her father wouldn't talk about it. Like many people who um, uh, grew up in a particular time when it was not good to be indigenous. Like a lot of he didn't go to residential school, but a lot of people who did wouldn't speak their language. Would you know be, be very would not talk to their kids about culture. He was very much like that, um, and so it was through uh, you know ceremony and community connection uh, that my mother came to sort of understand that history and actually develop a, uh, an Indigenous complex trauma program, uh, which she's been teaching over 30 years in reserved communities across Canada and in urban centres um, to sort of address the aftermath of residential schooling and mainstream child welfare. Yeah. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. You can listen to John's podcast for a more fulsome account. <laughs> That's right. Jeff, Jeff actually teaches the course with his mother. It's kind of neat. Mm -hmm. And Jeffrey, how far back can you can you trace your Métis roots? Uh, to my great grandfather. Yeah, yeah. And what's like in terms of timeline? Would that be early 1900s, late 1800s? Um, gosh, that's a good question. It's been a while since I've looked at the documents that our families have. It's some, it's, it's got to be the mid 18. My guess would be the mid 1800s. Yeah, yeah, around there, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mitzi. So, um, very interesting hearing your your background, uh, Jeff, because I'm wondering about um, like knowledge and what is seen as knowledge. Um, who ascribes that? And you know, oftentimes through through the process of assimilation you know, 
there is that distancing of original knowledge and 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 maybe sometimes we need to turn that that on its head and and it's time for us as Canadians to listen and to understand to really listen um, so one of the debates that is is happening right now in our province in our country is what to do this week it is Canada Day and it is a time, you know, I'm I'm an immigrant, you know, my my family, my, myself as a small child immigrated to this country. Mm -hmm. uh, so Canada Day has a particular symbol and a particular meaning for our family. Mm -hmm. But right now, as a nation, you know, we need to reflect. Yeah. And so what what speak to Canada Day and what would you like to see happen on Thursday? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be a somber day. We're going to see a different, a different type. I hope we're going to see a different sort of reflective Canada Day across the country. I certainly know it's going to be incredibly different for the Indigenous community and for non-Indigenous people and Indigenous families and for allies who have Indigenous friends and are threaded into all the stuff that we've been talking about. I know that one Indigenous organization in Toronto, Council Fire, is already planning um, a, a Canada Day march, which is going to have a very different scope and focus. Our agency will be, you know, releasing a statement uh, around some of the things that we hope that all Canadians will reflect on. Um, but I think it's um, it's an it's 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 a it's it's going to be an opportunity for all of us as Canadians to really stop and and think about uh, what Canada means to us and for us um, and 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 to ask ourselves some really important questions about how much we know about the history of our country and how we got to where we are and to understand um, some really concrete actions that we might need to, need to take moving forward right because I think what I don't want to see and I think what Indigenous people don't want to see um, is just kind of more words and platitudes and thoughts and prayers and reflections about this stuff. Because though the reflection piece is really important, um, you know, we know and, and we, we starkly know that what is needed is action um, in, in, in many different ways to sort of address the pervasive and ongoing impacts of that colonial history. Um, to support the kind of healing that we've been talking about and to move forward in true, you know, reciprocity and partnership, um, which was the intent of the original treaties, right? I often go back to those original treaties, which was all about sharing territory, living together. I think about that two-row wampum belt right here in this territory about Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people moving forward, walking in a good way, not, not interfering with each other, right? Um, and uh, getting back to that. So I hope that that's what Canadians are thinking about. I hope that our celebrations are a little bit different this year um, and I hope it gives us time to reflect that, and that that leads to concrete action. Um, Jeff, um, imagine for a moment that Pope Francis has joined us on this podcast. Mm -hmm. What is it you would like to say to Pope Francis? Now there's a question. <laughs> I, I, I'd be, I, I, if, if the Pope was here, I'd be, uh, I think I'd be pretty triggered. I'd be thinking about all of, uh, not only the 215 kids in BC, but the 751 in Saskatchewan and the hundreds of others that I know are buried across. I know we're going to find thousands of kids. We're going to find thousands. We're almost at a thousand yeah. already, right? Yeah. We're going to find thousands of kids buried across this country, Indigenous kids that died needlessly. And the government knew. The government and the church knew. I've been thinking a lot about Bryce lately and the Bryce report and the work that he did to demonstrate how unsafe these schools were. I mean, I would ask him why the church continued. Why, why kill the Indian to save the child? Why was that the axiom, right? And and why, why will the Catholic church not apologize? I do not understand. And I would ask him to come here to Canadian soil like Trudeau kind of alluded to. Um, and I would ask him to make some, to think about some real change. Um, I would ask him when and if, you know, when the church is planning to re return some land to Indigenous people. I would ask him what his thoughts are on spiritual repatriation, because so many of our community members are, are deeply Catholic, because that was, that's what was taught to them in Indigenous schools, right? Um, and, they, and they were taught for, for decades that it, was, that it was evil to practice their Indigenous culture. I would ask what the Catholic Church's tangible plan is to address that history and to actually take some accountability for their role 
and the schools that they operated uh, and the work that, you know, and the, and the destruction and oppression that they've continued to contribute to. Never mind the continued abuses of kids, you know, within the church and the work that the church has done to cover up that ongoing abuse, right? I would ask them what, what the action is going to be because it's deeply needed. I, I do wish Pope Francis was on this call <laughs> because those are all <laughs> rather um, pointed questions. Um, I uh, am going to do an interview two days from now with a really good friend of mine who's an um, Indigenous teacher. And the question I'm going to ask him, and I, and I, I want to put to you, is why is any Indigenous person still a Christian? Mm. It's a very good question. Um, you know, and it's, are you asking me? Or are you going to say, you're going to ask well, No, no, so, I'm going to ask him too, but I thought yeah. I'd take advantage of the opportunity yeah. to ask ask you. I don't know what your your yeah. spiritual or faith background is, but it it, it strikes me as, as very curious that uh, indigenous people are some of the most fervent Christians that I know and um, our regular church attenders uh, guide their their lives according to the Christian tenets um, and clearly have choices. They don't have to do this, but they, they continue to, to do it. And arguably the church has been one of the more um, problematic agencies uh, of repression of indigenous peoples. So yeah. I thought that I would put the question to you and I might test your question against his answer as well, yeah. or your answer against his. So, you know, the first thing I do want to say is a lot of terrible things have been done in the name of Christianity and by Christian mm -hmm. folk. I, I do want to say that that doesn't represent every Christian. I know a lot of really good Christians. So I just, that's just important to say. Uh, it's also important to say that, you know, when something is beaten into you, it can be just as hard to beat it out, right? Mm -hmm. And Christianity was beaten into Indigenous people systematically uh, in, in, in incredible ways uh, over a very long period of time. It has also become uh, integral to the way that some Indigenous communities uh, continue their own practice. It's not the lines aren't clear anymore. They're not blurred. A lot of people took the Christianity that they were required to practice and, and threaded and integrated some of the Indigenous stuff into it. We see hybrid models, right? I, I've seen elders that say the three, the three braids of a sweetgrass braid, the three strands of a sweetgrass braid represent the Holy Trinity. I know that's not, that's, if I talk to some other elders, I'd, I'd get a smack for something like that. But some other people are really are convinced that that's right. And so over time, you know, Christianity has emerged in ways that, uh, you know, indigenous people needed to practice Christianity or they couldn't practice anything at all. Indigenous people are deeply ceremonial. So like in some other places, like in many other places in the world, they found little ways to bring in their own culture and ceremony into the Christianity that they were required to practice. Those people then came home from residential schools with no idea how to parent, uh, no other connection to their culture, and the only spiritual and ceremonial stuff they knew was that. So what did they do? They passed it on to their kids in all sorts of dynamic ways who continued to carry it on. Um, and so now we're in a place where I think it also is, I mean, and I've seen stuff on Twitter and elsewhere, um, challenging this question, asking, you know, is it time uh, for people to think about uh, is it, is, uh, you know, what they do with their Christian faith as Indigenous people in the world today? Um, and it's a complex question that probably needs to be answered on a personal level. Um, but I think for me, particularly as an agency that has a child welfare mandate, um, and, 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 you know, we are transforming and decolonizing child welfare on a daily basis. And a lot of the prevention services we talked about earlier are what help us do that. We are focused on prevention and early intervention and doing everything we can to keep families together. But when the intergenerational legacy of our country becomes um, so intense that for a period of time, a child needs to be removed for their own safety, we don't have Indigenous homes to place them in. And often they get placed with non-Indigenous foster parents that happen to be Christian. So I think for me, everybody has to answer this for themselves as an adult and as a youth. But what's really important, and I want to bring us back to the kids again, our future, those sacred little bundles, those Indigenous kids that are the youngest and fastest growing demographic in Canada. It's important that we expose them to as much, if not more, Indigenous culture than we do 
all the stuff from other religions and then ultimately it's going to be their choice right because this stuff does come down to a personal choice but people have to have the context and the resources to be able to make that choice in a good way i guess that's my answer off the cuff yeah that's, that's a pretty impressive answer yeah pretty impressive thank you And Jeff, how do, how would you, um, you know, as we're approaching Canada Day and, you know, the, the issues with the, the children and, and the graves, how would you start, like, start a conversation with children, just trying to explain what's happened and, you know, Canada Day, should, you know, some people I've seen, they've been changing signs from Happy Canada Day to, to Thoughtful Canada Day. How would how do you start a conversation with people to to explain that? Yeah, I mean, we want to be age appropriate and we want to use our own comfort level. I have two boys. They're five and nine. My boys know about residential schooling. Uh, my, my kids are also mixed. My kids are black, white and indigenous. So they know a lot about slavery and the transatlantic slave trade, and they know a lot about residential schooling and, and colonization. And we talk about that in very age appropriate ways. Um, and so I think it's about, um, you know, sitting down and, you know, talking to a five-year-old is different than talking to a nine-year-old, is different than talking to a 13-year-old, is different than talking to an 18-year-old. But in all of those iterations, you know, our vocabulary and context shifts in ways um, that get, get a similar point across. And that's really that we're having a really important conversation as a country right now. Uh, and we realize that some of the promises that were foundational to the creation of our country have not been kept. And that because of that, a lot of people are really hurting right now. And, and because of all of that pain that we have to acknowledge together, uh, and that is our responsibility to address collectively, things are gonna look a little bit different this year, right? Um, and, and maybe instead of focusing on, you know, fireworks and, you know, whatever other, I don't know, I, I grew up with a lot of indigenous celebrations, so Canada Day was never big in my home. I don't, it's fireworks, right? And, and eating and stuff. But instead of all, all, all of those things, you know, maybe we spend a bit of time and, you know, read an indigenous story, learn something about our indigenous, our neighborhood that we didn't know, understand the people that stewarded the land that we've been able to benefit from, um, and, and do that in concert with other celebrations that are important uh, to our family and community. That's something I, I might suggest. Yeah. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, we're, we're near the close of, of our hour. Um, Jeffrey, I'm, I'm going to let you as the guest, the guest of honor, lead with the closing remarks. Misty, did you or Mitzi, did you want to get in there before I close? I, I saw. Do, I do because um, today's Google Doodle is. Uh, I, I thought it was really inspiring. It's Mary two acts early, and uh, she's a Mohawk woman um, from. Uh, I think it's a uh, Kanawek in Quebec. And um, and she she married a non-indigenous man, and under the Indian Act, she lost her status mm -hmm. as um, as an indigenous woman, and she fought it. She was mm -hmm. an activist, and she fought it. And uh, in, in 1985, the Indian Act was changed because this is gender discrimination. Yep. You know, as as a woman, um, because she she married a non-indigenous man. She lost her identity under mm -hmm. under Canadian law. And so, you know, sometimes the law itself is wrong and, and needs to be challenged and, and needs to be changed. Um, you talked a lot tonight, Jeff, about um, those bundles, uh, those, those, chill, those sacred bundles, the children. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I'm wondering, you know, what is the legacy of our generation collectively for these sacred bundles, for these children, you know, like your your children, you know, three different nationalities sort mm -hmm. of right in there in this one person. And um, and so the, the Canada of the future is going to look different from the past. But what is it that we're going to um, endow them with. You know? Yeah. So I just want so, you to comment on that as we wrap up. So maybe I can address that question while wrapping it up in my spontaneous closing remarks. Does that sound okay? We'll see what happens. Yeah? yeah um, go for it. Okay. So one of the things that I like to tell people is that the promise of Canada was a beautiful thing. 
at some point, somewhere, words were spoken. There was a vision. There was an idea. There was a thought separate and distinct from all of the oppression and terrible stuff that continued that we could take all of the best knowledge and innovation from the settlers who came to this land and others who came with them forcibly or not and bring that together with all of the knowledge and innovation of indigenous people and put that all in our basket and move forward in a beautiful way sharing and caring in partnership and collaboration that's a beautiful thing right to me that's that's the Canada that I want to celebrate, right? We are so far from that place right now. I'm a cultural anthropologist by training. My PhD is in cultural anthropology, and I think a lot about cultural reproduction. I think a lot about how, as humans, we make the world that we live in. On a daily basis, we decide that we're going to let a comment stand or not let a comment stand. We're going to uh, continue to enact a certain policy in our workplace or we're going to advocate for it to change. We're going to shop at a particular place or not shop at a particular place. This is all of the stuff we do on a daily basis to remake the world that we live in. All of us as Canadians need to ask ourselves one fundamental question, and that's whether we're here to replicate or whether we're here to innovate because it is so easy to replicate the status quo. Those gears are a finely oiled machine and they move forward with the quiet hum of systemic racism that continues the oppression of so many indigenous and racialized people in our community. We have been talking about this for a year, right? But all of us have an opportunity to move from replication to innovation simply through the critical awareness that we have that opportunity as humans. Whether we're five years old, 15 years old, 40 years old, or 72, we can consciously decide to make different decisions in our daily lives that create a more just Canada that gets back to that beautiful promise that I think that our country can be and that I know that if we all collectively work together, it will be. So one of the things I would leave you with tonight is just perhaps a reflective note about how each of us uh, as Canadians can take some time on July 1st to think about what our role is in that collective process. The work that needs to be done in our minds, in our hearts, in our spirits, in our families, in our households, in our communities, and in our nation to work towards something that is more equitable, that is more just, that takes care of everybody in the human family in ways that I think somebody probably thought of when we began the mission of creating our country, Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, Mitzi, closing words. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, I love the image that you painted, and it is all about in the post-COVID environment that we must build back better. You mm -hmm. know, there are a few things that we don't need to take into the post-COVID society, and a lot of what we talked about tonight are, are some examples of that. You know, I want to wish uh, all of the constituents, uh, those that are viewing, a happy Canada Day with your family and with your friends and with your community and, you know, stay safe, get your vaccine if you haven't already done so and uh, enjoy the summer. Thank you so much to Paul and to John uh, for continuing this dialogue in this town hall format with our constituents. I think it's a really important uh, way for us to reach out during these times. Thank you so much, everyone. Miigwech. Miigwech. Thanks, uh, Jeff. Um, you articulated brilliantly uh, the the dream that is Canada, and possibly at this point we're not seeing that dream as we should be seeing it. So I, I appreciate your um, hope that you had in your message, and I think that's important to articulate when we are all going through real questioning times. Um, so thank you for uh, thank you for that. Um, Thank you for, um, as Mitzi said, this was a safe space. I think we asked some fairly pointed questions that uh, run through people's minds, um, not necessarily the questions that one would anticipate in a podcast. Um, and thank you for, for rolling with those questions and articulating the, um, the response. And finally, um, most of our podcasts have been about vaccines and vaccinations and the COVID, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we sometimes don't celebrate our successes. And I want to just do a shout out to Scarborough Health Network. Um, I think we were some stumbles at the beginning. I think they really picked up their game. 
And we are now having many of the postal codes in Scarborough Guildwood ha have vaccination rates that exceed or indeed far exceed um, Toronto averages and um, provincial averages and national averages. Um, in fact, I Canada-wide, we're at about, I think, 77%, 78% vaccination. And I think the number is 30%, 30% somewhere in there for double vaccinations. Um, and sometimes in the process, we Canadians don't celebrate our successes, but we are number one in the G7, number one in the G20, and number one in the OECD. Um, that is a very significant accomplishment and Canadians need to um, add that into their reflections on on Canada Day. So again, Jeff, thanks. As always, you are a <laughs> supremely articulate individual and I just enjoy talking with you. Thank you, John. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> Jeffrey, I'd like to say miigwech. Thank you so much for uh, being here with us this evening and uh, the very thought provoking conversations given us a uh, lot to ponder as we uh, about to enter and celebrate our, uh, I'll say our thoughtful Canada Day. Uh, it's been a great pleasure having you here this evening. I'd also like to thank you for all the work that you do for with Native Child and Family Services, an amazing organization that goes back to the 1980s uh, for all the work and the programs that you bring to the Indigenous community in Toronto and in particular here in Scarborough. I've had a few instances at City Council when we've been discussing uh, Indigenous policies and our own Indigenous Affairs Office uh, at City Hall. And I, I've mentioned the large Indigenous population in Scarborough. And I've had some of my Council colleagues have actually gone to the laptop and, and looked it up and said, wow, you do have a large Indigenous population in Scarborough. And I said, yes, we do. And we're well looked after by Native Child and Family Services. You just opened up another community hub in uh, in Malvern and one in Mount Dennis, but another one in Malvern. And we have, uh, you know, a longstanding, beautiful one at, uh, at Kings Road and Galloway. So I can thank yourself and your staff for all the work that you do for uh, our residents here. Thank you so much, Miigwech. And to Mitzi and John, uh, another great town hall meeting. Uh, we've always worked well together. I know we're gonna keep working for the residents of Scarborough Guildwood and uh, to the residents of Scarborough Guildwood, thank you for tuning in this evening. Keep following all the, the rules and guidelines and uh, we're you know, ramping up our vaccinations numbers and uh, I think we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. So I wanna thank everybody, uh, stay safe, stay well and uh, have a thoughtful Canada Day. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye everyone. Okay.